Well, the clock making was started in Connecticut really about 1800 when Eli Terry in uh, Plymouth married uh, and uh, started his uh, wooden works clock manufacturing. He made a few a year, sometimes he would, uh, around 1803, he was making perhaps 100 a year. And after he got a few made, he would put them on his horse, pack them, and go out to the western country to sell them. Western country being as far as Poughkeepsie, New York, or White Plains, and he'd come back. Sometime he'd have a ham in lieu of cash payments, and he'd start to make it some more. However, about 1805, the Porter Brothers of Waterbury contracted him to make 4,000 clocks, movements with a dial. They were to supply the material, and he was supposed to supply the movement, dial, the bob, and the pendulum rod. And he t t undertook that contract, which everyone thought at the time he was cuckoo, because it was unheard of making that many clocks. And it was a big gamble for Terry because he had no equipment to do a mass production like that. But he had a vision. He hired Seth Thomas and Silas Holdley. Both men were uh, joiners, carpenters, house builders to, jo to help him make the machinery and develop the process for making these in production. Well, the first year they worked, they didn't produce one clock but they did produce the equipment to produce, mass produce these clocks. And the first year, nothing. The second year, they were able to produce a thousand clocks complete. Third year, they produced 3,000, completing the 4,000 clock order. It was unheard of. And these peddlers were coming in, grab, taking a consignment of uh, clocks from the Porter Brothers, going out to the Western country, and selling them, coming back for more. And it was uh, really uh, a triumph for, for Terry. But what he actually did, most of all, was to create mass production through uh, quality control and interchangeable parts. Had it not been for interchangeable parts, he would still be working on the 4,000 order right now. I got interested in wooden works by accident. When I was working down at the foundry as a salesman, a man came in whom I knew was a uh, contractor, and he had some castings he wanted to make for a I, Joseph Ives wagon spring clock, which is kind of a rare clock. And uh, they were, the parts were so small, the foundry didn't want to fool with it. But he talked me into taking the job on my own. so. I made the patterns to his specification, and then I went to have them cast, and nobody wanted to make the molds, they were too small, so I made the molds, cast them, cleaned them, and I ground them up, and I called them up, and he came down after them. And when it was time to pick them up, I found out something about the man. <laughs> he had short arms and deep pockets. He just didn't want to reach in his pocket to pay me. So uh, what I did is I settled for what he said was a, a real surprise. He says, I'm going to bring to you a wooden works clock, case and all, as payment, which I figured at the time, he, he, knowing now he may have paid $10 for it, maybe 15 So I got the clock. I was amused at how and amazed how they were made. I took it apart, made the drawings. And I said, now I'm going to make them in production. So I started out and I designed the machinery as if I was going to be making them out of metal. And that's completely wrong because it's a completely different uh, trade. So the first year, I made enough gears and pinions that were scrap to put them in my fireplace and heat the house. That's how many I made that were wrong. So then I smartened up. I started to investigate how it was done, and as you will see from the machinery that I have, it was done more with saws and fly cutters, and I finally mastered the production. And 
I, I still made mistakes, but every one I made, I got a little smarter. I've been doing this for now since 1965. And uh, then when I was uh, 58, uh, 58 years old, I was so loaded with work, I couldn't do both jobs. So I re retired early. And uh, then my son, a few years later, was laid off. And he couldn't find a real decent paying job. So I said, take all the equipment I have thousands of gears and pinions I had in stock, I says, take them home, clean out my basement. So he cleaned out my basement. I could actually see from one end to the other. I got a little lonely two years later. I had all the new equipment rebuilt. And uh, as you will see in the basement, it's, uh, it's loaded. You have to have a map to move around. <laughs> In the beginning, uh, as a machine designer and a draftsman, tool maker, and what have you, I, I kept looking at this as something that would be made in present day with machinery and cutting gears and stuff like that. And uh, I finally had to, uh, re I realized that they didn't do it that way. They had primitive wooden machines with a very, very small amount of metal attached, a spindle, a cutter, maybe a pulley and a leather belt, all the rest had to be out of wood. So that I made up what I believe is to be uh, copies of what they had in those days. Uh, there was uh, Hopkins and Alford in um, Thomaston, or it would be Howington actually, uh, uh, had a patent on a three spindle machine for cutting gears. And uh, he, Peddled that thing all over New England, all the way out to Ohio. And he had a patent that was uh, very good, and he, he sold many, many of them. And not one of them has survived. There's not one machine to make wooden, wooden gears or pinions of, in any amount of production uh, survivable today. So uh, from that, I created these machines, which you will see in operation, or uh, you'll be able to view them. And I feel that's how they made them. Well, the problems I had in coming up with the design was I wasn't looking at the pinion or in the gear teeth as I should have. And when I finally uh, realized how they, how they were shaped and why they were shaped that way and why the mesh of the gears to the pinions had to be a certain way, then I realized how they had to be made in those days. And from that, I redesigned the machine and I made uh, one machine that I can cut a thousand gears a day on. However, I can't sell that many. <laughs> and uh, but it's a, the result is exact duplicate of what Terry made and all these others. Well, the wood that was used uh, was cherry for the gears or wheels that they called them, and they used laurel for the pinions and red oak for the front and rear plate housing, and white pine for the seat board. And uh, the wood, the, the equipment that they had in those days was very primitive. Uh, as they had a fro and a maul, a buck saw, an axe, hammer, an auger, a uh, fro and the maul cutting or splitting out the wood. And the splitting out of the wood for the gears they had to split them out as a wood shingles, then put them onto a bench and draw knife them, and then plane them, and check them for sickness. And uh, of course, in the interim, they had to have them seasoned. And uh, 
Then uh, they would cut out the circular part, stack them on the lathe, turn the outside diameter, stack them up on the machine, and cut the teeth. And they had to be all kiln dried, otherwise they would expand and contract as much as 14 to 15 thousandths per inch uh, of diameter. And uh, one time there I was going to get real smart, and that's part of the <laughs> wood that I had to burn in the fireplace. I made a whole batch of gear blanks, and I said, I'm going to take them upstairs, put them in the oven, and cook them for 170 degrees for four hours. Beautiful. They came out. They were dry as a bone. Beautiful. So I turned them to exact diameter, and I cut the teeth on them. And I said, now I've got it made. Oh, how, what, a, what a surprise. Two days later, I went to measure them. They gathered the moisture from the atmosphere, and they grew. They were almost egg-shaped. So there we are, more kindling wood. So now I find that uh, uh, kiln-dried wood, and don't go forcing it too much, and still for a three-inch diameter gear, you have as much as 10 to 12 thousandths of an inch diameter expansion and contraction, which when you figure out the depthing of the gear to the pinion, that make allowances for that, all goes well. No, the uh, autobiography of Chauncey Jerome is wood, uh, making of wooden gears and pinions, he stated that the uh, laurel, which is a crooked wood, it can be gathered up and thrown on the cover and it, and it dries quickly and can be used. That's used for pinions. It's very good. And the reason they used it was this. They could send their children out to cut it. It was such a small uh, item to cut. It would season quickly. It was round and all you had to do is cut it to length and the diameter, put it in the lathe and skin off the diameter to the desired length and then it would be ready for your pinion cutting. Uh, Chauncey Jerome was one of a, a joiner or a carpenter who worked for Terry making one of his first clock cases around 1815 or so and uh, he made the first pillar and scroll for Terry and he then uh, branched out on his own and he really got to be a fantastic clock maker or entrepreneur because he devised, he and his brother devised a 30-hour brass clock, which uh, sold much cheaper and more, uh, uh, it was a much better uh, running clock than a wooden work, so it wasn't uh, affected by moisture. And as you will see later, they even had the dial with a large hole in the center for the salesman to show the prospective buyer, he said, look, here we have a brass works clock. You can see right through the dial, and you can see it working. And his statement at the time was, it could be got up for a dollar less and sold for a dollar more. <laughs> of course, he was referring to the case at the time, but uh, he really put the brass, the wooden works out of business. And in about 1840, uh, the wooden works phased out because 1839 is the time that uh, uh, Chauncey Jerome developed that clock. The uh, making of cases and the movements was usually a separate operation and you had a lot of outsourcing. Cases were made in Litchfield, Goshen, all over creation, and it was something like 80, 90 cents a piece for a completed case. And the movements were selling for between 75 cents and a dollar a piece. And the, when they put the two together, plus the weights and all, uh, you had a six or seven dollar item. But imagine that, it would be like owning a Jaguar or a Cadillac on your, on your mantle right in those days. And I can just imagine people 
hearing about Joe Blow down the road of five miles, just bought a clock. They would go visit him, sit down and watch it and wait for it to ring the hour. I mean, that was really a, a, a joy to watch. But uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, outsourcing in this manner too, putting the movements together, putting them up, they used to call it, and you would get them up and the grandfather or the tall case movements, many uh, had their seat boards stamped with an initial. And that initial, say, JF, was he was the guy that was contracted to put that together. So if ever came back, the, the uh, prime contractor would know who did the job and who was going to have to re repair it. Well, uh, the fact that they're made of wood and they can keep as good a time, uh, they keep a better time than a brass spring-driven clock. A spring-driven clock has a uh, high torque when it's fully wound and it diminishes as it time wears on uh, to uh, down to, say it's an eight-day clock. Uh, when it gets down to uh, close to the eight days, it doesn't have the power to, to the escape wheel. So there is a variation in time. Uh, the power curve would look somewhat odd. Uh, but a wooden works being weight driven has constant torque delivery. So that you have a constant delivery of impulse to the pendulum. I, uh, on the engineering drawings that I made, uh, I started to make them because I can't work without instructions. And even if I have to have the instructions made by myself, at least I know what to follow. And if anything goes wrong, I'll know where to correct it. And uh, that has been uh, a great help to me. And uh, I have made engineering drawings for 30 or 40 American Wooden Works clocks anywhere from the 30 hour to the 8 day and f from the count wheel type strike to the rack and snail type and the uh, uh, movements made are, are exceptionally the, uh, the repair parts or the um, replacement parts you can almost count on them from one to another that's how close they used to make them and it's, it's amazing because there wasn't that much of, uh, of uh, engineering uh, know-how in those days. They didn't have drawings, micrometers. They had a caliper and uh, a ruler. And a ruler was probably copied from another ruler, copied from another ruler, and who knows what size. But they all had samples that they worked to. And they were, it, those were the, their drawings. No, the, the drawings, uh, there's nothing that uh, has, uh, has appeared or shown up about drawings on clock movements, except the patent drawings. And those are very, very scant, and uh, they more or less give uh, written dimensions of so-and-so gears so, so far apart, and so on and so forth. But actual drawings, no. Because the drawings that I make, I feel they have to have every bit of information, the angle, the radius, the diameters, the thickness, everything. Well, I, the most, my biggest customer is uh, the American Clock and Watch Museum who sells them through the internet and uh, at, the, at the museum. And... Uh, I also uh, send out quite a few flyers. I get uh, some from uh, clock makers, clock collectors, mostly clock collectors that want to make them. And uh, uh, quite a few of them have been successful in making those uh, 
plucks. I have one fellow down in North Carolina for three years now. He has uh, purchased a set of plans for Silas Hoadley toll clock. Then he wanted to make the equipment to, to make the gears. So I sent him a video uh, of my old uh, wooden equipment and parts of drawings that I made for that equipment. He made the equipment, he made the movement, and he made about 200 phone calls to me for instructions, and he finally succeeded, and he was on cloud nine. Well, I, I passed it to him, and uh, uh, he was laid off at the time and couldn't really find a job, that, you know, that would bring in enough money uh, to satisfy him. So he took it over. At first, he had a little few difficulties because he wasn't uh, versed on every little aspect of the business and of making parts. But now, I don't want to. I don't want him to hear it. But uh, he's making me look uh, <laughs> second rate. <laughs> No, I'm not obsessed with time. Time making, uh, maybe. <laughs> I've uh, collected a f uh, quite a few clocks. I've rarely r sold any, except to a couple of friends of mine that I've sold some movements and clocks. But uh, I try to get one from each of the makers, Eli Terry, Silas Hoadley, Seth Thomas, uh, Rodney Brace, Eurasis Hodges, and uh, Mark Levenworth, William Levenworth, and quite a few, there's an almost countless number of uh, makers. And it's amazing to find out there's not that much difference from one maker to the other of a grandfather clock or a shelf clock. They all maybe had a couple of little changes just to have their little trademark, but uh, they were almost all, some of them were interchangeable parts. There was actually hundreds of makers, and uh, but one thing that happened that uh, in, in the clock industry that almost ruined it, in 1825, 1822 rather, Eli Terry came out with the Terry number no. 5 movement that you will see operating. That's the shelf clock, 30-hour time and strike. Well, up to that point, Eli Terry, Set Thomas, and Hoadley were the only ones really making any clocks. But they had what nobody else had, and that was the experience of quality control through interchangeable parts. Quality control was the byword. I mean, you, you, you had to listen to that and follow it, otherwise you were in trouble. What happened was everybody saw, yeah, heck, it's easy to make clocks. So they got some guys and cutting up gears and hacking away. They did not have the ability to conduct their business with quality control. And therefore, the, a lot of clocks were not working properly. The peddlers would take them out in the field and have to take them back because they were not working. And it took quite a while for the... Uh, industry uh, outside of Terry and Thomas and Hoadley to catch on to quality control. Once they did, it w went, went away. I mean, it, uh, they were making clocks by the zillions. Yes, yeah, so those were uh, subcontracted out. One subcontractor was Candace Roberts, the daughter of Gideon Roberts. And he was a clockmaker until about 1805. And her dials always had a bird up in the arch. Beautiful. And uh, the dials were made out of uh, uh, quartered uh, poplar wood. Very nice poplar wood, planed, and it had dovetailed spines in back. And it was coated with uh, white lead. They, uh, I forgot the name, what they used to call that, uh, but it's uh, white lead, which is no longer available for paint. 
and uh, then they would paint on the spandrels, the numerals, and the decoration using gesso. Some had gilding, but they did a terrific job. Now the uh, movements all had to be put together once you had the parts made. And uh, as an example, I have a hundred uh, plates, which is the, called the rear housing and front housing for the shelf clocks. And I have parts for the internal parts for a hundred of them. Now those are sub-assembled, the assembled rather. The pinion is assembled to the gear and so on and so forth. And they're all labeled in a box. And it's actually not, not much of a job putting it together uh, because everything, quality control, control that. And once you put it together, I usually put just the time side, timekeeping side train in, check that out. If that works, I'll go to adding the motion train, which is the one that operates the hands. When that's done, I take a gamble and put in the strike side, which is not as critical as the other two because that's uh, as soon as your stri strike signal uh, sets off, brrr, she'll go like a, like a rabbit, you know. But the time side is critical, and once you get the time and then the, the motion train for the hands, you're pretty well set. It doesn't take long. Yes, well, pretty much, uh, although the cutting of the pinions and wheels and uh, uh, turning the, is all machine work. Yeah, right, the handwork comes in in the sub-assembly and assembly.